good to be uh, back again this year and to see everybody, um, to be among uh, friends, uh, old friends, new friends, some yet undiscovered friends, um, and to uh, have the chance to engage with you over the next couple of days in terms of the, uh, in, in terms of the moment in time that we have right now. And the, uh, the introduction to our panel, or the question at the beginning of our panel in the next dialogue session is why is restorative justice so important right now? And um, I am going to reflect on the experiences we've had uh, developing national principles and then uh, the UN at the UN level as well. Uh, but when I answer that question for myself, I guess what I would say very quickly is that we, we do have a moment in time right now. Um, uh, and for those of us who've been around the restorative justice community for, for uh, many years, um, there is a sense of renewed excitement um, uh, and renewed opportunity uh, to advance the work that we have toiled away at for many, many years. And uh, I know for those who have been around a long time, there had become a period of fatigue, I would say, setting into the restorative justice community. And um, it's good to see uh, that energy uh, return to the community and to be able to, uh, to focus on the future. Uh, and having said that, though, I, 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 this is also a time where I think we have to invest ourselves in the heavy lifting of the next steps. Um, and that heavy lifting is not just uh, an exercise for elected officials, and it's not just an exercise for senior uh, government officials at the various uh, levels. It's an exercise for the restorative justice community. This is our moment in time to translate all those lessons we've learned, all the work we've done, and all the discussions we've had into something that can uh, uh, scale itself to a more broad spectrum criminal justice approach that can benefit the lives of uh, all Canadians and, and, uh, and others. And that is a big challenge, uh, but uh, I, I believe we can rise to that occasion and that's why we've actually designed, that's why the conference organizers designed the format of the conference the way they did, so that we can begin the process and continue the process of that heavy lifting here today together. So I, I would really encourage you to engage um, deeply in the conversations that we're about to have uh, and to, to, uh, to share your thoughts to share your wisdom and to share your reflections. I also want to thank um, uh, a number of people. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Rwanda people for welcoming us, welcoming us here today uh, and to the Elder for the opening prayer this morning, as well as to uh, the, people, the speakers who've gone before me, uh, Minister Whale and uh, Parliamentary Secretary Casey, uh, Senator um, Sinclair, uh, and others. Uh, thank, you. thank you all for uh, sharing your, your thoughts. And I particularly, before I forget, want to thank the people who planned this conference. Uh, they have planned two conferences this year, uh, an international conference uh, in the summer and then now this one. So by the end of tomorrow, if they look a little tired, it's well deserved. Um, so be extra kind to them, maybe even buy them a drink um, or, or whatever, whatever their preferences are. But uh, uh, thank you to uh, Nova Scotia for being such a gracious host um, this year. Uh, we, uh, we promise to leave you alone next year. Um, and give you a, give you a rest. You can come on and be hosted by somebody else. Um, so, uh, as uh, as you've heard, um, there has been some work going on at both the national and international level to renew the conversation around the principles of restorative justice, and uh, that uh, is a continuation of work that stems back to the early two thousands uh, here in Canada and elsewhere, and. Uh, at the time, and like now, uh, the restorative justice community recognizes the importance of principles, and this leads a little bit into the next panel, but um, if for as long as I've been around the restorative justice community, one of the, one of the almost heralding cries that you hear when you talk to people in the restorative justice community is that it's all about principles. It's all about values. Uh, I'm surprised we haven't turned that into an anthem yet, but... Um, uh, but, but it is. It ultimately is about values. And uh, at our best, our values um, guide us. Uh, and they, they, uh, they serve a number, they offer a number of benefits to us. First, they, they unite us, they bring us together, and they give us language that allows us to be a shared community. That's what our principles do. They also explain us to people, uh, which isn't always easy, as you all know. 
uh, to bridge the gap between someone who's never heard of restorative justice and what we would like them to take away. And it's our values that people remember. And a good illustration of this is the many, many conversations I have had and you have had about accountability and what real meaningful accountability means and what it means to us in the restorative justice community. Especially when we are confronted with, with the, the perception that we're somehow soft on crime. Um, and what real accountability needs to look like. I would say our principles also ground us. They help us remember uh, why we do what we do and what we're trying to achieve. Because often, uh, as we're out there doing the work, uh, we, we too are like anybody else, will fall into our patterns of just repeating the same process. The assembly line continues and we, we continue to do this work. But our values call us back. Our values give us a place to test ourselves and to make sure that we're hitting the right measure in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And I would say our principles also offer us a vision. And it's the fact that we have principles that allows us to extend restorative justice and the applications we currently have into brand new applications. And as being here in Nova Scotia, it's worth noting, obviously, the, uh, the wonderful example of the, the events here at the dental school and the leadership shown by this province to take restorative justice values and translate them into a context uh, other uh, than what would normally have happened in that circumstance. And so kudos to everyone involved in that. But values offer us the ability to take what we do here in the criminal justice system and to extend it into all sorts of reaches. The downside of values, which often get pointed out to me when we start to actually try and write these down, um, is that they have, they have the exact mirror impact as well. Our values sometimes end up dividing us, uh, and we have had some heated discussions around some of our values and how we frame them, and where uh, the lines of restorative justice should be drawn. Uh, and, uh, and we have people who talk about maximalist models, and people who talk about all these different models, and we sometimes allow these to fracture our community versus pull us together. <coughs> I would also say that sometimes our principles can obscure us. Uh, that make, they make us difficult to understand sometimes. Uh, and the best example of this, or the best illus uh, description of this, this is, uh, I heard, was the fact that most of our values and principles are what they call aspirational principles. <laughs> that is, they're who we hope to be someday, uh, at our best, in our best moments, and, um, and, and that's wonderful to have that name. But they aren't necessarily always definitional, because if you hold us to the test of our own principles sometimes, well, you may not hold up all the time. Um, and that's not to say that we shouldn't continue to have aspirational uh, values, but it does sort of help create a, a bit of blurriness about who we are, and it takes boundaries, uh, um, hard, makes our boundaries hard to sometimes find. Uh, sometimes um, uh, our, our principles can leave us a little adrift as well. Uh, in terms of, uh, they can be vague and big notions, um, and therefore we sometimes not quite sure what they mean and how to apply them. Uh, one example of this, which I think is a, a, an interesting discussion, came up recently again to me, is how uh, willing we may or may not be to do restorative justice approaches with people under the age of 12. So people below the age, age of criminal responsibility. There are those among us who say, Absolutely not, because uh, that we have we have the, we have the premise in Canada that there is an age of responsibility, a criminal responsibility age, and therefore we shouldn't use restorative justice to expand the net. Um, there are those who would argue, though, that restorative justice is, is about something bigger than that and bigger than community. And are not our children part of our community? And do they not deserve the best of our processes as well? So our principles don't always give us easy answers to these questions. Uh, because we, we emphasize things in different ways in different places. And lastly, I would simply say sometimes our values can hold us back. Um, and uh, that, uh, that is probably a, a, sometimes a useful reticence or a useful um, hold back. But I think about, for example, the question of voluntary participation as a principle. Voluntary participation has been a very important component of what we've done here in Canada. It's a voluntary model, and I would argue, I would imagine most of you would uh, stand up and uh, champion that. But having said that, there are, um, there are realities out there that if we design a restorative justice system that we want to expand to uh, a broader segment of things, we will have to wrestle with what voluntary means. Because people do not participate in the criminal justice system voluntarily. 
As you know, I work in corrections. I've had very few people come to me voluntarily. Uh, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the reality is we need to have a system robust enough to think through how we're going to offer a, re a response to crime that encompasses those situations that voluntary participation may not be there. So this can hold us back sometimes. And uh, I, I leave that out there uh, simply as a challenge and not as an answer, obviously, in terms of what we need to think about. And I invite you in the conversations that come to think about these things. So as, uh, as was said earlier, um, we have launched a consultation on a set of national principles. And this is not a, a, a brand new set of principles. These principles were actually crafted in 2003 under the leadership of David Dobney and Bob Cormier and others. Uh, who, uh, who were fresh back from their experience at the UN, where they had led the cause um, to, uh, on behalf of Canada to create UN uh, principles uh, for uh, restorative justice. And uh, at the time, uh, both of those conversations were fairly challenging conversations. At the UN level, um, uh, most countries, quite frankly, didn't know what was, we were talking about. <laughs> restorative justice was a, uh, an ambiguous concept that we, you know, uh, even here in Canada, let's face it, back in 2000, most of us, if you went up to your neighborhood store and said something about restorative justice, you almost knew nobody was going to know what you were talking about. Today, that, that, today that, thankfully, that's not necessarily the case, but that was really back in 2000. And at the UN level, uh, layered with all sorts of UN machinery, that was a difficult conversation. And uh, most countries participated in that from their lenses. And so they were coming and trying to make sense of this new concept. And to everyone's credit, they worked through those issues and found a way to come up with a common set of principles. And since that time, lots of people have debated whether that was worth it or not, um, uh, because uh, very few people probably even know there are UN principles for restorative justice. And most of you probably don't regularly cross-reference them in terms of your day-to-day -day activity, nor do people in other parts of the world. But what they have done is given the UN a capacity to take the first order of justice out into the world. And so they fund training and they do all sorts of other things to, to take the best of our restorative justice lessons and bring them to the world. In Canada, we had, a, I think, a much different conversation within the restorative justice community because at the time, we were uh, relatively still in our infancy as a community and debates about where the boundaries of restorative justice were, um, were difficult to establish. And so we ended up with, a, I think, a fairly good set of uh, basic principles uh, that, um, uh, that Canada should be proud of. But again, my guess is most of you don't regularly reference them. Um, and, um, uh, and that's understandable because, because they're, they're, it's a document that's meant to guide, not a document that's meant to dictate. And um, uh, so one of the things the FPT committee did, and my co-chair Barbara Tomborowski is here with me, um, is we decided that 15 years later is probably worth a bit of a refresh. Uh, in terms of what those principles are. Not a rewrite, but a refresh. Um, and um, I have to say, we watched this at last year's event, and the, the, it, was a, it was a good conversation, but the biggest question I got in the corners uh, in private was, why are you doing this to us? Um, <laughs> why are you starting these the conversations over again? Um, and in part, it's because we need to make sure that we're grounded again in the principles, and that the principles reflect who we are today. And so I want to invite you all to participate in that. So if you haven't already had a chance to do that, I would like you to seek out your FPT partners uh, that are relevant to you, but also the National Restorative Justice Consortium is leading a uh, consultation process. So they're, they're helping do some online consultations, so there's lots of opportunity to participate in that. And the last experience I'll, I'll share with you is our experience at the UN this year. So in May, uh, I was privileged to be with the Canadian team uh, at the United, uh, United Nations Crime Conference. And Canada, as part of its new leadership role and new enthusiasm for restorative justice, decided to table a resolution on restorative justice. Again, more as an update than a, than a rewrite. And so what we wanted to do is seek from the world a sense of where, we, where things had gone with restorative justice since those principles had come out. And what I'm extremely pleased to tell you is that everybody knew what restorative justice was. Um, when we went around this time, there was not a lack of understanding at all. And there was um, no resistance to the premise of restorative justice itself. Uh, of all the countries that were engaged in those discussions, everybody knew what it was and wanted to push the envelope further uh, in terms of advancing. That's good news. 
uh, it was still not an easy negotiation um, for one of re for one primary reason, and that is Canada uh, in this effort to continue uh, to pr to talk about what is just for all was fairly insistent that we had to acknowledge um, the impact on Indigenous peoples around the country. And that is a much more challenging conversation at the international level. And we spent many, many hours working through with uh, different countries how uh, that played out in their particular context and what we were looking to do. And uh, without going to airing all the dirty laundry of all of, that, of everybody that was participating, that I'll simply let you, let you know that we were successful. We were successful in uh, drawing out uh, the need to attend to the needs of Aboriginal peoples wherever they find themselves in the world. And uh, as part of that process, we are going to be, uh, we are currently through the UN hosting a, a, a survey uh, about what countries are doing with restorative justice and the goal is to have uh, Canada lead an experts group from around the world, including Indigenous peoples, um, uh, to discuss the value of the, the principles of where we might go for, further with them. So the landscape has shifted in 15 years where we're on the map, and in fact we're much higher on the map than we ever were before. And I come back to my earlier comments. That means though for those of us who've toiled in this field, those of us who love this work and who believe in it, the heavy lifting is about to begin. Um, so if you're not feeling it, get ready. Um, there'll be some stretching at the breaks, I'm sure, but, um, but we are uh, thoroughly looking forward to having your thoughts, your wisdom, and your guidance in helping us to find what we as a sort of justice community can truly offer. And I like Don's uh, questions uh, as a frame for which to start those conversations. And I guess what I would simply add to those questions is, is questions around our principles. So do we know what our principles are? And have we defined them well enough? What role do they play for us in terms of guiding our day-to-day -day work? How can we make sure that our principles, as we write them, retain the values that we intended when we wrote them? And then thirdly, and probably for me most importantly, how can we translate those principles into functional, scalable, and reliable processes that provide a measure of consistency and confidence for Canadians who are affected by crime? If we can answer that final question, we will have done well. So thank you for your comments, thank you for the time we can spend together, and uh, I look forward to chatting with all of you.